the mountain of the Lord and to the house of the God. Well, Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Here we are. We have a new visitor. Nice to have you with us. Welcome to Beit Torah, House of Instructiones. Okay. Um, welcome to our subscribers. Tenemos 60. Okay, 60. I said that in Spanish because we have a, a Spanish visitor, so I wanted to just. Sí, gracias. So, um, so, welcome our subscribers. We consider our subscribers part of our little group here. Organization, yeah. They are just as important to us because they they listen to the messages. We've mm -hmm. had people come from distances in Virginia and to visit Virginia. here who are subscribers. So, so we're grateful. For all those that are drawn by the spirit of the Ruach HaKodesh to hear the word of the Lord, and I pray that I pray that I'm open wide for the spirit of Yehovah to flow through me in the message today. The Parsha for today is Devarim, which means words. We're beginning the last book of the Torah, and it'll cover chapters 1 through chapters 3, 22. Now, in this Parsha, Moshe speaks to all Israel on the far side of the Jordan River, positioning themselves near the eventual crossing into the Promised Land, which is across from Jericho. He reviews their journey through the wilderness from a completely different perspective, keying in on spiritual points of an almost messianic shadow. If you go back to chapter 31 in Bimit Bar Numbers, you'll see that Moshe, the, the name of the, the Parsha was Masse, which meant stages. And I find it very interesting here that in Masse, in stages, Yehovah had Moshe review with the nation the places that they traveled to, okay? by their names, not by what took place there, though. He jarred their memories to reflect over the past 40 years where God had led them to and all the things that they had experienced and gone through. Particularly, I would think that it was God was trying to stir up their memory because he was primarily speaking to the children that now had become of age in their 40s and 50s. He reviews their journey through the wilderness. In our last Parsha, as I said, Masay, Adonai instructed Moshe to record each of the stages of their journey from their starting points of each stage geographically. It was the first day of the 11th month of the 40th year where Adonai ordered Moshe to tell them. It infers he spoke these things after he defeated Sikon, king of Amori, and Og, king of Bashan. Moshe took it upon himself to expound this Torah, okay? This Torah, which is Devarim, the fifth book of what you call the Pentecost, the, the Pentateuch, okay? And so Moshe is approaching, Adonai is having Moshe approach their journey 
from a different perspective. And I want you to, to listen to the difference because I believe that this was the spiritual side of what God was trying to stir them up, to remember, to become acquainted with who they were, who their parents were. Because much of this relates to how their parents handled the journey through the wilderness, their attitudes, their frame of mind, their trust, their faith. In chapter 1, it says, Adonai spoke to us in Horeb. And he said, you've lived long enough by this mountain. It's time to get moving and go to the hill country. To the Arabah, to the Shafila, to the Negev, to the seashore, to the land of the Kanani, to the Lebanon, as, as far as the great river, the Euphrates River. Did you know that the nation of Israel, the people, the children, Travel to the Euphrates River? This was all during their, their move through the wilderness. They even went, they had to go to the seashore, which would have been the Mediterranean. Mm -hmm. That's interesting, you never hear that. Now why do you think that Yehovah led them? Because the Euphrates is all the way up in modern day Iraq. Okay? It's where the Garden of Aden was originally. Very interesting. Do you know why? Because Hashem was preparing them to understand the boundaries that Jehovah had promised that. Abraham would inherit the land. He literally led them through to the, the key points so that they could understand. Abraham, God just laid it out in words. But the children of Israel traveled there to see it. He said, I have set the land before you. Go in and take possession of the land Adonai swore to give to your ancestors, Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, and their descendants after them. Do you know, we just talked about what it means to, to, to swear an oath. It's a pledge, it's a promise, it's a commitment. And God wants his people to understand what his word means and what he's committed to. And he even will take you there to see it. Hallelujah. During the 40 years Israel, it appears, journeyed to all these places. It appears God showed them the boundaries that he swore to give Avraham. But here, he begins to point out, through Moshe, the character and nature of of the hearts and the minds of the people. Isn't that interesting? Would you say that Moses, through Adonai, was very direct and straightforward? Could you imagine if you were the children of Israel and I was Moshe? Well, my, my Hebrew name is Moshe, but I'm not Moshe. <laughs> not this Moshe, by far. <laughs> I'm not. 
But if I said to you, you're too heavy, a burden for me to carry alone. You imagine that? Uh, Ramon, you're too heavy of a burden. A pain. Imagine a pain. even a pastor saying to the congregation, you people are a burden to me. Yeah. I can't do this all by myself. Or, I mean, I'm reading right out of the Torah right now what Moses said. He said, he characterized it the type of the people. He said, you are burdensome, bothersome, quarrelsome. How can I bear this by myself alone? Interesting. So, what did Moses do? He was directed and, in, and, and advised by, um, by Japheth, his father-in-law, mm -hmm. to establish for yourselves from each of the tribes men who are wise, understanding, knowledgeable, and will make them heads over you. Oh. So God, through Moshe, is setting up a authority structure by which people are going to have to be managed, led, instructed. He says in verse 13, I will make them heads over you. Now, I, I just want to reflect back to Massey, which reviewed all the geographic locations they traveled to, now he's reviewing with them the structure of authority that he set up in order to deal with the issues that would arise amongst the 12 tribes and the people. He certainly couldn't handle it himself. He admitted that. The line went around Mount Sinai. <laughs> A couple of times with all the complaints and the quarreling. And so, but the people agreed that this would be a good idea. He took the heads of the tribes, men that were wise, knowledgeable, and made them heads. Made them heads over the leaders in charge. When you're in charge, it goes without saying that you have a certain amount and degree of authority and here he points out that in charge of thousands hundreds fifties tens tribe by tribe so we happen to be where there's the tens we don't have the thousands we don't have the hundreds that's not where God has us right now and if we're to be with just 10, that's perfectly fine with me. Mm -hmm. What does it say? Little is much with God. Amen. Little is much with God. So Moses, again, is pointing out how an authority structure was set in place. A spiritual and governmental authority was set in place. And we have this here with just a small group we have. It's necessary because issues arise. Quarrels happen. People are offended, disappointed. Things have to be reconciled. You, you can't just sweep it under the rug because it, it, it becomes infected and eventually affects the whole group really important that we understand God's authority structure amongst his people in whatever group you're in and as we covered in other parshas with Miriam and Aaron with Korok and uh, the two, I forget their names, they, God was pointing out to them, 
When you rise up against Moses, you're not rising up against Moses. You're rising up against me. Okay? So when God sets authority structures in place in his kingdom, in his body, when you rebel or you fight against or you, you don't peaceably and humbly work through things and you don't communicate, you might as well realize that you're not communicating with God. You're not humbling yourself before God. It's the authority structure that he put in place. And it started in the wilderness. This is really important. It's, it's interesting that God points out their character. Then he points out what he put in place in order to deal with that and to maintain order and reconciliation and resolve. When you don't have knowledgeable, wise men that are as elders or deacons who, who exercise their gifts, God's given them those qualities for a reason. You need to recognize them. And you need to encourage them to grow in them. That's your job. To help them mature into the men of God that God's called them to be. It says he also gave you orders at that time concerning all the things you were to do. Well, who gives order? Who gives orders? Think about it. Someone in authority. A general, a captain, a sergeant, a manager, a supervisor. Mm -hmm. They hand out orders. They hand out tasks of things that have to be done. And they're responsible to see that those things are accomplished. Is it any different in the wilderness here? Is it? Are the same fundamentals in place? Did God not put them in place through Moses? Is Moses not reminding the nation of God's order in order to bring two and a half million people, tribe by tribe, into the promised land? They went through all the vast and fearsome desert. And it says, they did as Adonai our God ordered us. We did as Adonai our God ordered us. Most of the time. Most of the time. interesting that Moshe is reviewing their journey from a very different perspective and that is their walk, their relationship and their journey that personal experiences of the things that that our relationship with the Lord is really all about our attitudes how we communicate what we do what we adhere to concerning God's order, His word, to forgive, to reconcile, to, to work through issues that arise within the tens, the fifties, the hundreds. Where would Israel be if, if those elements were not in place? Now, there could have been wholesale rebellion, but I don't think they would have done that because after seeing God come down on Mount Sinai 
and after seeing Korok being devoured into the earth, and his, I think God instilled a level of fear upon them, a godly fear and awesomeness of the power of the God they serve. That hasn't changed. It still exists. God is still the same God today, yesterday, and forever. In verse 21, I find it interesting. God begins to whisper comments to the people that he would later whisper and speak to, to Joshua when Yehoshua took over, took Moses' place. It says, look, Adonai your God has placed the land before you. Go up, take possession as Adonai, the God of your ancestors, has told you or has instructed you or has ordered you. Don't be afraid. Don't be dismayed. Do you remember what he Moses said to Joshua, Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid or dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you whithersoever you go. God's kind of, kind of priming the pump of when they reach that point where they literally enter into the promised land. But you would not go up. You didn't obey. Instead, you rebelled. You rebelled against the order of Adonai, your God. Now how is today any different as it was then? Wherever you're at, whatever, whatever group, who follow God, the creator of the universe. It's the same today. They would not go up. They rebelled against God's order. It's really important that we know what God's orders are and where do we find those? In the Torah. The Torah is the foundation that leads us and directs us and explains things we may come across in the, in the Tanakh, the remaining books in what the Christians call the Old Testament, and what's spoken in the Gospels and the Epistles. But you rebelled against the order of Adonai, the instruction of Adonai, the calling of Adonai, your God. And you complained. We had 600 gallons put in the cistern. Three days later, it was all gone. That was a month and a half ago. We had no water here. We had, could not flush our toilets. I had to fill up five gallon buckets of water. By the grace of God and leading me to the right plumber, he came because we couldn't prime the pump, even though we had the water. But we lost all the water because there was a leak in the plumbing system of the pump that drained down the drain and in four days 600 gallons of water disappeared. But God intervened and provided. God, he led us to get it fixed and then one of the elders, Eric, gave us a good idea. We had a container out there. He had a sump pump. Jose had a hose, and we all worked together as a team mm -hmm. and created a means by which the water. 
hundreds of gallons that pour off of the back roof are feed into the cistern is from the pit roof. But there's more water on the back roof. And God instructed us on how to walk through resolving this challenge. Any different than being in the wilderness without water? Where God instructs you on how he's going to provide that? It's no different today. We still have to hear and listen to the voice of God. We've got to discern it. And then we've got to act on it. And we did. And Jose and I did a few things before this recent heavy rain came from Hurricane or Debbie. Cyclone Debbie. 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 Yeah. And lo and behold, we had everything set. The pump, the, the uh, sub pump was plugged in. The pump to our plumbing system was all repaired. And in a matter of one day, God poured 700 gallons into our sister. I had to unplug the sump pump. Because if I had let it run, we would have filled the basement up. Because <laughs> it would have overflowed into our basement. So, there's a, a living, current day example of trusting God. We have very little resources here. I mean, we can pay the light, and, you know, buy challah bread for the onen, cut the grass, do a few things. Wine. But 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 that's okay because you know what, God keeps providing in ways Hallelujah. that. Hallelujah! Yeah, He's good. You provide. Exceed my abilities and capacities. That's what took place in the wilderness. But what did man try to do? As we read on, it says, Adonai, your God. This is to the nation of Israel, the 12 spies. Moses is reviewing this. Adonai, your God, who is going ahead of you, will fight on your behalf just as he accomplished all those things for you in Egypt before your eyes. Whatever it is you're dealing with, God will go ahead of you and fight on your behalf. You've got to know that. You've got to trust him. You've got to believe. You've got to have faith. And the only way that that materializes is in the midst of it, you do it. But, Santo. Adonai heard what you were saying, became angry, and swore. Here we have the word swear, swore again. You remember what it can mean? It can mean to make a pledge, or to commit, or to make a promise. But to swear can also mean to put a curse. Did God put a curse on that nation, on that group of people? who didn't exercise faith and trust God? Well, he sure did. What was that curse? See, they didn't trust God that they could overcome the giants in the land. Then, 
what added misery to pain is they repented and then they said, okay, we're going to go up and we're going to now take the land. And God said, I'm not with you. Don't go. You're going to be defeated and destroyed. Hallelujah. God said to Moses, tell them that he will because Because of you, Adonai was angry and you too will not go in there. So he told them to not go. They didn't listen. They didn't listen. And God said, you're going to die in the wilderness. This generation will not enter the promised land. You will die in the wilderness. That begs the question, what is it that God's trying to bring about today? What is it? What was needed here was unity. Unity. Oneness, a bonding, a harmony. Did God ever convey to the believers in this current era, the era of salvation, of Yeshua, and the evolution of salvation, the good news coming to the Gentiles and to the Jews? Paul speaks of Jew and Gentile one together in Messiah. He speaks of God creating a one new man. Have we seen one new man? Have we seen Jews, believing Jews and Gentiles, come together as one to worship and carry out the mission and the call of God? We have, which is just a trickle. You see, God's plan is that Jews and Gentiles become one in Messiah, that Amen. You come in and you become a part of the culture of Israel. What did, what did Paul say? That you become part of the commonwealth of Israel. Amen. That you're grafted in. That we become one new man. And so, Moses continues to review I'm just trying to give you a shadow of what had to happen because the Israelites in the wilderness coming together and entering into the promised land, they weren't just Jews. We know that. It was a mixed multitude. Many different people who left Egypt with them because they decided they're going to follow the God of the Hebrews. He's the most high God. Amen. The gods in Egypt, the God of the Hebrews, destroyed them all. So, the same applies in entering into the land. There needed to be a unity, a oneness in the body, in the the nation of Israel to enter into the promised land. We are here in a place, the end of days, where we see all the, the elements coming together, where the nations of the world want to destroy Israel and eliminate her, eradicate her from, from the earth. We know that's not going to happen. <coughs> God said, 
then when I bring you back into the land, you will never leave it again. You will never leave this land. I will keep you and cover you and protect you. You will never leave the land. So, so when we see Moshe is reviewing with the nation the, the spiritual elements of their walk with the Lord in trusting, trusting the Lord, trusting the Lord to deal with the giants, trusting the Lord to cross the Jordan, the Jordan River, and take Jericho. God encourages them. He encourages them in chapter 3, I believe it's chapter 3 or chapter 2, verse 24. He says, Today I will start putting the fear and dread of you into all the peoples under heaven, so that the mere mention of your name will make them quake and tremble before you. Do you see that happening today? Gee, I wonder why the Hebrews were persecuted down through history. I wonder really what was gnawing at the people that persecuted our people down through the centuries. And even today, maybe it's Yehovah. And his spirit has placed the fear and dread of the God of Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov upon them. And their insecurity, their fear, causes them to act in peculiar and ungodly ways. Because God is bringing Israel, it will be where the Messiah rules from. He's not ruling from New York, Los Angeles, Tokyo, Bogota. Rome, Bogota. he's ruling from Yerushalayim, the Amen. king of the universe. Amen. And all peoples of the earth will flock to Israel. All men will be required to observe Pesach, Shavuot and Sukkot and to go to Jerusalem those who do not their land will become famined nothing will grow it's interesting now we see this in Bimidbar and Devarim, and the elements are all about the nation of Israel and their relationship with Jehovah, their personal faith and trust in the Creator. Now, where do we see that expressed in the Gospels and the Epistles? Because the same thing that was being spoken by Moses is being spoken by Yeshua to his Talmudim, his disciples. And he presents it to, to them in this manner. In Yochanan, John 15. And I'm just going to read it. Man. And I want you to think how how what Yeshua is saying relates to what Moshe was saying to the nation of Israel and all the things that God set up in order for them to succeed rather than having failed 
on varying occasions because they didn't trust and have faith in God. Chapter 15 of Yochanan, verse 1 to 15. I'm going to read it slowly because I want you to think. Think about even your own life and how this affects you in your journey and the things you're challenged with. I am the real vine, and my father is the gardener. Did you know Yeshua was the real vine? Did you know there's fake vines out there? Do you know there's vines out there that proclaim to be vines? And just weeds that look like vines. And my father is the gardener. Did you know the creator of the universe is the gardener? And what does a gardener do? He cares for the garden. Amen. And what's in the garden? The vine. And what's on the vine? All the branches. Every branch which is part of me. Are you part of Yeshua? Every branch that is part of me but fails to bear fruit, he cuts off. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes it so that it may bear more fruit. Just like when you prune your flowers, you cut them back so that they produce more flowers. Same thing in the kingdom of God. Same thing in an assembly of believers in a community. Right now, because of the word which I have spoken to you, you are pruned. So we know that God's word prunes us. Are you listening? Yes. Do you understand how God is pruning you through his word? Or are you locked into a doctrine and a way of thinking that that you were you were taught and indoctrinated in but never never instructed never taught and educated there's a difference we were just talking earlier Jose and I an evangelist or a speaker comes to a place and Real easily, people believe everything they say. Generally, they just take it hook, line, and sinker. Oh, that was a great evangelist, or that was a great speaker. But do you know God's word well enough to discern between truth and lie, between that which is genuine, the, the word of God versus man's? And I... I speak to that in my own messages. If you find or hear something that doesn't line up, I expect you to bring it to my attention. I expect you to not come at me like, you know it all, you got it right, and I'm wrong. It's not about being right or wrong. It's about what's the truth. Are you willing to dig down with me into God's Word to uncover the truth, to clarify the words and the message, to bring it in line and true with the Word of God. Do you think that the disciples did that with Yeshua? I'm sure they challenged him because Yeshua was speaking from the Torah. There were no Gospels and Epistles. He was speaking from the Torah. He says, because of the word which I have spoken to you, you are pruned. Stay united with me, as I will with you. For just as the branch can't put forth fruit by itself apart from the vine, so you can't bear fruit apart from me. Same thing with the nation of Israel. If they didn't do accordingly as God instructed and ordered them to do, they disconnect themselves from the vine. Moshe 
gave the orders and the instructions from the gardener, Jehovah, spoke to Moshe, instructed then the nation. And they disconnected from the vine. They didn't, they didn't honor what they were ordered and instructed and taught to do. We see that throughout Christianity, throughout Judaism, where we know what the Torah is, we know what the scriptures say, but we just do what we want to do anyway. We don't follow God's order and instruction. And then we wonder why, why we're in disarray or why our life isn't where we'd like it to be. Because we're not, we don't know God's Torah, which are his instructions, and we're not walking them out. We're not applying them when we come upon the situations in our personal lives, in our families, in our communities, we're not applying God's word. What do you expect? Things get a little, a little crazy. Out of order. Yeshua said, I am the vine and you are the branches. Those who stay united with me and I with them are the ones who bear much fruit. Because apart from me you can't do a thing. Unless a person remains united with me, he is thrown away like a branch and dries up. Such branches are gathered and thrown into the fire where they are burned up. Now God is, is long-suffering. He loves us. But even the true vine, even the branches of the true vine, get cut off and thrown into the fire. That's what it says. Understand the allegorical message. If you remain united with me and my words with you, then remember, if you remain united with me and what? My words. What's the name of the Parsha today? Devarim. In Hebrew, that means words. Isn't it interesting that Moshe is conveying words to the nation of Israel to remind them of the accounts and the places not the physical geographical places they went to, but the places they went to where they were burdensome, where they were quarrelsome, where they rebelled, where they didn't follow God's instructions and orders. Sounds to me like unless a person remains united with me, he is thrown away like a branch and dries up. Such branches are gathered and thrown into the fire where they are burned up. And he says that, that if you remain united with me, meaning doing what I call you to do, and my words with you, the words of God calling you, instructing you, telling you, what needs to be done according to his word and you don't do it, you get cut off. But if you do that, he says, if you remain united with me and my words with you, then ask whatever you want and it will happen to you. It will happen for you. So you wonder why things ain't going your way? Well, you're probably not probably not united with Yeshua. To be united with Yeshua, He is the Word made flesh. Amen. If you don't know His Word, His instructions, His order, what He's called you to do, according to His Word, He's not, he's not going to give you whatever it is 
You want just not. Hallelujah. This is how my Father is glorified. You see, listen to this. When you obey God's word, when you follow his instructions, when you do as he's ordered you to do, it says that this is how my Father is glorified in your bearing much fruit. This is how you will prove to be my disciple. United with me, united with my words, whatever you want will happen for you. United with me, united with my words, the Father is glorified. You want to glorify God? The Shekinah glory of God coming down in your life? You will bear much fruit. And it's how, notice, by being united, united with His words, it's how you will prove that you are His disciple. If you ignore His words, and I mean from Bereshit, Genesis, to Revelation. That means the Torah is important. And if you don't know it, you can't understand the Gospels and the Epistles. Because the men that wrote it were Jewish. Men. And that's all they knew. That's all that was available at that time. And Yeshua is speaking right here, referencing to the Torah, those words. The, the historical books and the Proverbs and the Psalms weren't even written yet. Interesting. Interesting. They were written while Yeshua was here, but Yeshua is talking about the Torah, the mitzvot, the 613 mitzvot, of which... The Gospels and Epistles enumerated 1,500 more commandments to follow. So if you have an issue with the Torah and 613 commandments, well, you better start on the 1,500 that are in the Gospels and Epistles. Because they're there. Read them. It's the language. Just as my Father has loved me, I too have loved you. So stay in my love. If you keep my commands. That word is mitzvot. Commandments. Not just love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself. That's just the main heading. It's everything under there that you need to understand. That you need to walk out and do that shows by your actions that you love the Lord and you love your neighbor. When you reconcile, when you forgive, when you come together as a community and tackle challenges and share in carrying the burden to build up the community. If you keep my commands, you will stay in my love. So that means if you don't keep his commands, you'll fall out of his love. You'll fall away from his love. Just as I have kept my father's commands and stay in his love. So we're to keep Yehovah's commands as Yeshua did. Who spoke to Moses in the wilderness? Yehovah. Amen. Who spoke to Yeshua? Yehovah. I and my Father are one. I see what He is doing. Yes, hallelujah. And I do what He tells me to do. I do not do that which is of my own inclination and desire. I do what I see my Father doing and what Amen. He instructs me.
Just as my Father has loved me, I too have loved you. So stay in my love. If you keep my commands, you will stay in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commands and stay in His love. I have said this to you so that my joy may be in you. Do you want to be happy? Do you want the joy in your life? A smile. Hallelujah. Filled with life Smiling. and joy. And shalom, peace. Well, he tells you how to acquire that. He said, I have said, to, I have said this to you. What have I said to you? If you keep my commands, you will stay in my love. So that my joy may be in you. And your joy may be complete. So if you don't have any joy today, you're probably not united with him and his words. You probably don't know the commands that he wants you to walk out. Not all at once. Our walk with the Lord is one day at a time. In the situations and experiences we face. But just as the Israelites needed to do accordingly as God had ordered them and instructed them, we're no different today. The blessing that we have is He put it all together for us. We have a, a manual to follow. They didn't have a manual. They had a man that spoke the words of Jehovah. They had to remember it. How much more are we accountable to seek the Lord? He's looking for those who will worship Him in spirit and in truth. God is a spirit. And it is the truth that we need to seek. Yeshua is the truth. He's the Word made flesh. He's the truth made flesh. He's the way made flesh to follow. He says it right here. So if you want joy, you need to dig into God's Word. And I would say start with the Torah. Hallelujah. Because that's the foundation. In order for you to understand the Gospels and the Epistles. I... I just finished a, a lecture series by a Dr. Mark Nanos. And we're going to see in the near future a new translation of the Gospels and Epistles, I believe. Because when, when the Messianic community bifurcated and split, and Gentiles who didn't really want to follow Torah back in the end of the first into the second century, and they started their move away, started their own groups, which became eventually the Catholic Church, which that, that spirit moved through the Catholic Church and became the Lutheran Church, then the Calvins, then the Presbyterians, and... We could go down the whole list of 45,000 different denominations that exist in the world today that all started back when believers, former pagan believers, Gentiles, Goyim, were not interested in following the Torah. Now how can God call forth one new man, Jew and Gentile, one in Messiah? How can you ask when God calls the people of God, when we say Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, we're saying to God as Jews, we are the people of God. We are your people. And in that culture at that time, in the 1400 BCE, you were identified, your culture, your people were identified with one of the many gods that existed. 
in the world. But the Israelites were identified as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, which was El Elyon, El Shaddai, Jehovah Sidkenu. And I could go on to the many names as God revealed himself. But as Jews, we're not going to change our culture. God in the wilderness created our culture in the Torah, in the experiences. We're not, we're not going to change our culture and become Christians. It's not going to happen. To us, that is, that, that's like denying that you're a Jew. But it's interesting, Paul says that the Gentile is to become grafted in. It says it in Ephesians. That the Gentiles are to become a part of the commonwealth of Israel. That means they don't change their ethnicity, their, their, their uniqueness of whether they're Greeks or Syrians or Italians, or, or you know, English, you maintain those qualities that characterize your ethnic group. But you come in to the lifestyle and the culture that God shaped the nation of Israel into, and at that time, both Jews and Gentiles. Was it not? It was a mixed multitude. And so, what makes you part of the culture of Israel, part of the lifestyle of Israel? Real easy. God rested on the seventh day. Back then, there were no Sundays. God wasn't thinking the day that he was going to call the day of rest. He wasn't thinking, should I make it Saturday? Or Sunday. It wasn't even a choice. The days were numbered. One, two, three, four, five, six, Shabbat, seven. And then God revealed all through the Torah, the Moedim, the festivals, the gatherings, that God came out and clearly said, these are my feasts and festivals. And you, he was talking to the Jews, the Hebrews, and, the, and the, the mixed multitude, that you are to observe these for all time. That is the culture. That is where Jews and Gentiles become one new man. That's where you become grafted in the wild olive branch becomes grafted in to the natural olive tree, the nation of Israel. And you're, you, you embrace the culture Hallelujah. and you become a part of the lifestyle, which is observing Pesach, Feast of Unleavened Bread, First Fruits, um, Shavuot. The month of Elul, Yom Teruah, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Sukkot, Hanukkah, Purim. And, the, and those are most of the main ones. But that's what it looks like, no different than if you came to America and became part of of the commonwealth or of the nation of America, you become grafted in. You become part of the culture. If you're from another country and you came here, is your culture, are you still living the same culture here that you lived in the country you came from? Or have you assimilated into the culture of America? 
I say you assimilate. In the kingdom of God, God's people, those who are called by His name, those who believe in Him, they are called to be part of the commonwealth of Israel and the culture and lifestyle, but not lose their unique ethnicity. Jews have an ethnicity. And so do you. Oh, Dios, hallelujah. Verse 12, this is my command, that you keep on loving each other just as I have loved you. No one has greater love than a person who lays down his life for his friends. You are my friends. If you do what I command you, here we go again. Moshe said, do as I have ordered you. There will be one who will come like me, Moses said. Mm -hmm. And here we have Yeshua saying, you are my friends if you do what I command you. Do you know what you're not doing? Do you know what you're supposed to be doing? How do you find that out? Let me read it again. If you remain united with me and my words with you, what are my words? Right here. Are they remaining with you? Or do you take them lightly? Just pass them off. No longer, I no longer call you slaves, because a slave doesn't know what his master is about. But I have called you friends. Because everything I have heard from my Father, I have made known to you. Who did he hear it from? His Father. Who's his Father? The gardener. Who's the gardener? The creator. Who did Moshe hear it from? Heard it from Hashem, Yehovah. Who did he tell? The people. Who did Yeshua tell? The people. Hallelujah. Was this some crazy Hallelujah. Jew that made up all this crazy stuff and Meshuggah? No. He heard it from the Father. And he's telling us. It's up to us to listen. You're not connected to the vine. And you're not producing fruit, you'll be either pruned to produce more fruit, or you'll be cut off and, and thrown into the fire. Everything I have heard from my Father I have made known to you. You did not choose me. I chose you. Amen. Hallelujah. And I have commissioned you to go and bear fruit. Fruit that will last. So that whatever you ask from my Father in my name, He may give you. So the condition for God giving you the things that are in your heart, which He will eventually reshape into the things that he intended to be in your heart, not your selfish desires for the things of this world. He says, so that whatever you ask from the Father in my name, he may give you. So your heart's got to be in the right place. It can't be of your own contrivance your own desire borne about by your own discontent and quarrelsome and burdensome attitudes it can't this is what I command you keep loving each <coughs> other Amen. right there's a command are you loving 
Are you continuing and are you keep keeping to love each other? Or do you cut and run? If you do, you're not keeping his word. If you do, you're not united with him. Or his words are not in you. It's you that's in you. That wants what you desire, not what the Father desires. Remember, Yeshua is all about doing what the Father desires, not what Yeshua desires. Moses was not about doing what he desired, but what Hashem instructed him to give to the children of Israel. Nothing's changed. Without faith, you cannot please God. And I say to you, without faith in what's written, even in the Gospels and Epistles, which, which account for what is clearly history, which is clearly documented. And as Gamaliel said, when they approached him about stopping... The, the, the spreading of the good news by the Talmudin, the disciples, and, and Paul persecuting them. What did, what did Gamaliel say to Paul at that time? Before he had his, his uh, epiphany on the road to Damascus, What did he say to Paul? Gamaliel was the high priest. He said, Shaul, listen. Don't be concerned about these followers of the way of Yeshua. But they keep growing. And, and they're, they're sharing information about, you know, that's, that, that we don't follow this. And he said, listen. If we've had down through our history many messiahs. They've all disappeared. If this man, Yeshua, is truly the messiah, you will not be able to quench it, to stop it, to prevent it. It will spread because it's of God. Has it spread? Has it spread over the last 1,800 years? From one end of the earth to the other? Amen. Hallelujah. Bible. Logic. Common sense. One plus one equals two. He is the Mashiach. Glory. Glory. And may He reveal Himself to you. May you experience what Shaul, Rabbi Shaul, Paul, experienced. An epiphany, an enlightenment into knowing that Yeshua, the one who was hung on the torture stake, who bled and died and shed His blood for the atonement of our rebelling against Hashem. Hallelujah against Jehovah. May He reveal Himself to you. God. Seek Him. Amen. Get a hold of a, of, a, of a Kumash. Get a hold of a Tanakh. Get a hold of the complete Jewish Bible by David Stern. And seek the Lord. God said He's looking for those who will seek Him. As Jews, are we seeking Him? Has it gotten old? Even as Christians, has it gotten old? Has it worn out? Isn't it fresh anymore? Is it, is it just getting dull? The same old, same old? Well, infuse some life 
into your heart. God said, if you, if you want to know me, you've got to seek me. If you seek me, when you seek me, if you seek me with all your heart, then you'll find me. Bless you. Thank you. Shabbat Shalom. Shavua Tov. And may the God of Shalom, Yahovah, may the God of Shalom guard your hearts and your minds in Messiah Yeshua. Amen. And give you His Shalom and reveal Himself to you in whatever way is necessary for you to receive. Baruch Hashem. It was I who